Hey guys, how's it going? Keegan here for our last time in the word this week on a Saturday. I hope you are having a great weekend so far and that you are ready for Mother's Day tomorrow. Hopefully you guys have made your cards, gotten your gifts ready, wrapped them, and you're ready to give them to mom tomorrow on Sunday. I hope I'll get a chance to see you in person tomorrow at church, but if not, don't forget, we're still doing church online through, I believe, Facebook and YouTube. So there'll be a bunch of ways for you to hop on and do church with us tomorrow. But please don't forget, tomorrow is Mother's Day. Do not forget, it's a big day. I don't want you guys to forget it. Please mark your calendars. Remember, if you have it, make that last minute target run and go get something for mom. But today we are finishing up uh, this week of time in the word with psalm we'll be starting psalm 58 and we're going to be reading about how god is a just judge how god is a just judge and my question for you guys is why is it important that god is just when he judges us that god's foundation is built on his throne is built on righteousness and justice as god's word says why is it important that god is just in all things especially as he's a judge I'd love for you to answer that question today, but let's pray and then jump into Psalm 58. Father God, we thank you for another day of spending time in your word, Lord. We pray now that you would allow us to uh, prepare, Lord, uh, for today's reading by putting aside all of our distractions, Lord, and to think about what it means for you to be just and why is that important, Lord, that we would read about how you are going to judge all and realize that it's important, it's crucial that your foundation is built, your throne is built on justice and righteousness, Lord, and that we would praise you and be thankful for that. And finally, I want to pray, Lord, that uh, we would be all ready tomorrow for Mother's Day to uh, just be thankful for our moms, Lord, and to uh, give them that extra love that they deserve, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So let's start Psalm 58, all of Psalm 58 today. Let's go. To the choir master, according to Do Not Destroy, a victim of David. Do you indeed decree what is right, you gods? Do you judge the children of man uprightly? No, in your hearts you devise wrongs. Your hands deal out violence on earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. They have venom like the venom of a serpent, like the deaf adder that stops its ear, so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or of the cunning enchanter. O oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions, O oh Lord. Let them vanish like water that runs away. When he aims his arrows, let them be blunted. Let them be like the snail that dissolves into slime, like the stillborn child who never sees the sun. Sooner than your pots can feel the heat of thorns, whether green or ablaze, may he sweep them away. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. Mankind will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. To the choir master, according to Do Not Destroy. Yeah, so we see here that obviously God is going to judge. The righteous will rejoice when we see, when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his feet, as we see, it says in the blood of the wicked. But uh, mankind will surely say, surely there is a reward for the righteousness. Surely there is a God who judges on the earth. So what does that word uh, justice mean? What does it mean to know that God is a just judge? And why is that important for us? Those are our questions. I think it's something good for you to figure out. Drop a comment down below if you know what it means or if you have a question about what it means and we can work on answering that together today. A little more interaction today for our last day in the week. Um, secondly, we'll be back in Mark. We'll be doing Mark 7, 14 through 23. Mark 7, 14 through 23. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? 
Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean, and he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. In those days, when again a great... Yeah, so here we see, I mean, Christ is talking about how you guys shouldn't be worried about what you're eating. That's not what defiles us. It does, like the food that we eat doesn't matter in the sense of it's not causing us to, uh, just because we eat this or that, it's not causing us to sin. But you should be worried about what is coming out of your heart. The sinful desires that we have, those things that we act on, those things make us unclean. That's the point that he's making um, today. He says, don't worry about what you're eating, but worry about what is coming out of your heart. Thirdly, we are uh, doing 1 Corinthians again today. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 23. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 23. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple, and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple <coughs> is holy, and you are that temple. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. So let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. This is how one should regard us as servants. Yeah, so here we see, I mean, uh, Paul is telling us that our foundation, when tested by uh, trials, by fire, can only be Christ. The foundation that's going to stand the test of time, the test of fire, is Christ. It can't be gold, it can't be power, it can't be money. Our only foundation that can stand the test is Christ and Christ alone. It's what everything should be built off of, our salvation in Christ, our salvation through his death and resurrection, not how much money we have, not how much gold or silver we have, not how much power we have, but in Christ alone, that's the only thing that is going to stand the test. And that's what we should take from this text. Finally, uh, we'll be wrapping up like we normally do in the Old Testament. We'll be doing 1 Samuel 5 through 8 today. 1 Samuel 5 through 8. When the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the Ark of the Lord and the head of Dagon, and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. This is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. The hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod, and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon our God. 
So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. So they brought the ark of the God of Israel there. But after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a very great panic. And he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. But as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought around to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. They sent therefore and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel, and let it return to its own place, that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. The men who did not die were struck with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. The ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Phil yeah, so here we see, I mean, the Philistines who have just taken the ark, they, they bring it, they put it in their temple with lots of other gods, and the god that they serve, Dagon, this idol that they serve, they leave, and they come back to the temple, and Dagon's on the floor, they put him back up, they leave again, they come back, He's fallen over again, but this time his head has been cut off, um, signifying, I mean, God's power over <coughs> idols or anything in creation. So they realize this wasn't happening before this ark came here, before this God of the Israelites, uh, his ark was brought here. We need to get rid of this because this is, this means some, some bad stuff is coming from us. They're, they're even uh, kind of tipped off seeing how powerful God is and they seek to get rid of the ark. So let's continue in uh, in chapter 6 then. The ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us with what we shall send it to its place. They said, If you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty, but by all means return him a guilt offering. Then you will be healed, and it will be known to you why his hand does not turn away from you. And they said, well, What is the guilt offering that we shall return to him? They answered, Five golden tumors and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for the same plague was on all of you and on your lords. So you must make images of your tumors and images of your mice that ravage the land, and give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from off of you and your gods and your land. Why should you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? After he had dealt severely with them, did they not send the people away and they departed? Now then take and prepare a new cart and two milk cows on which there has never come a yoke, and yoke the cows to the cart, but take their calves home away from them. And take the ark of the Lord and place it on the cart and put in a box at its side the figures of gold, which you are returning to him as a guilt offering. Then send it off and let it go its way and watch. If it goes up on the way to its own land, to Beth Shemesh, then it is he who has done us this great harm. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by coincidence. The men did so and took two milk cows and yoked them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they put the ark of the Lord on the cart and the box with the golden mice and the images of their tumors. And the cows went straight in the direction of Beth Shemesh along one highway, lowing as they went. They turned neither to the right nor to the left, and the lords of the Philistines went after them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And when they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark, they rejoiced to see it. The cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stopped there. A great stone was there. And they split up the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the box that was beside it, in which were the golden figures, and set them upon the great stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices on that day to the Lord. And when the five lords of the Philistines saw it, they returned that day to Ekron. These are the golden tumors that the Philistines returned as a guilt offering to the Lord. One for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, one for Ekron. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and unwalled villages. The great stone beside which they set down the ark of the Lord is a witness to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. And he struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked upon the ark of the Lord. He struck seventy men of them, and the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great blow. Then the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? And to whom shall he go up away from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kiriath saying, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to you. And the men of kiriath came and took up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. And they consecrated his son Eleazar to have charge of the ark of the Lord. From the day that the ark was lodged at kiriath a long time passed, some twenty years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you, and direct your heart to the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and they served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on that day, and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. 
and Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. Now when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion, and they were defeated before Israel. And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as below beth -car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen, and called its name Ebenezer, for he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The cities that the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron to Gath, and Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines. There was peace also between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and he went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all these places. Then he would return to Ramah, for his home was there, and there also he judged Israel, and he built there an altar to the Lord. When Samuel began... Uh, so that would be, uh, we, uh, we did, um, seven there. Um, and then, uh, finally we have, uh, chapter eight, but before we read that, even interesting for us to note, um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard come thou fount, right? Come the fount of every blessing, right? Well, we can even see when he says here, I raise my Ebenezer. We can see what that means, right? We see here, it says Samuel took a stone and set it up in this bunch and called its name Ebenezer for he said till now the Lord has helped us that word Ebenezer meaning the that word Ebenezer meaning as we see here in chapter 7 it is the stone of help that's what it means so now when you're worshiping God and singing come thou fount you can know what that word Ebenezer means here I raise this stone of help signifying God is here to help my trust in the Lord so all we have left is chapter 8. So 1 Samuel chapter 8 is all we got left. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest, and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, No, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city. So yeah, here we see we end chapter 8 with the people of Israel saying, Give us a king. And Samuel saying, I don't think you know what you're asking for. And then God says, If they really want a king, tell them what's going to happen if they get a king. They've been unfaithful to me for a long time. So Samuel says, He's going to take your money. He's going to take your land. He's going to take your people. You're going to have to serve him. And they say, Yeah, it's fine. We still want a king. And at the end, they decide we're going to get a king. So in chapter 9, we see who Samuel chooses. 
but they're left with Samuel saying, go and tell as we see at the end, go every man to his city. And he is then starts the search for the king of Israel. And that's how we leave off today. So let's close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for another day to glorify you, Lord. We ask, Lord, that uh, we would glorify you for being a just judge, Lord, who is not going to bend the rules, Lord, who's going to judge us and everyone justly, Lord, and that we would glorify you for that. Father, we pray, um, God, that we would heed these warnings that we see even from the nation of Israel, not seeking to want to serve man, but want to serve you, not seeking for a king, God, but seeking for an, a holy, perfect God. Lord, that we would seek to glorify you and not uh, anyone else on this earth, Father. We thank you for your word, Lord, and we pray that we would praise you, Lord, as a just, holy, perfect, and righteous God. We thank you, Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. All right, well, that's it for today. I hope you have a great Saturday, and do not forget, tomorrow is Mother's Day. Don't forget Mother's Day. That is my last warning. You don't want to forget that. I hope you guys all have a great day tomorrow. I will hopefully see you on Sunday. If not, we will see you again soon. Have a good day. Bye.